Good day, everyone, and welcome back once again. My name is Pastor David McKenzie. This is Bay Community Church Virtual. It's always good to have you with us, and it's good to uh, make note of uh, all the mums out there. I guess this is a Mother's Day type of uh, weekend, and so the floral arrangement even has that little thing attached to it, and we want to thank all those folks like Marion who put it together here, and Laura, uh, Lori as well. And we, uh, we pray your mercy, the God's mercy upon this time, that uh, you might hear from the word, and then it might stir your heart by the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. And we uh, want to open up in prayer to that effect then. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for all you've provided to us. We thank you for the, the grace and the strength to move forward in a given week. And we uh, ask your blessing upon this time. We pray for your help in the midst of our understanding. We pray that um, you might stir our hearts by your Holy Spirit's presence. We pray, too, that your word would go forth in power and that your church would be encouraged and built up in your name. And we thank you, God, for this privilege and for this opportunity. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite Michael back in this particular situation to read to you from various lessons spread a little bit more out over the biblical testimony this particular week because we've had some times of late where it's just been gospel lessons and epistles, but this is a, a full spread today, so... We'll take it from here. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Dave. Yes, we start uh, way the, near the beginning, Exodus, first uh, reading, chapter 16, verses 9 to 30. Then Moses spoke to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord. For he has heard your complaints. Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat. And in the morning you shall be filled with bread. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that quail came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to one's need, one omer for each person according to the number of persons, let every man take for those who are in his tent. Then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over. And he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. And Moses said, Let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning. And it brew worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need, and when the sun became hot, it melted. And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up until morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink. 
nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Second reading is from the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 10. And lest I should be excluded, the correction, exalted, above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my affirmities, infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And the last reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Verses 13 to 34. The parable of the rich fool. Then one from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to them, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed 
like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Praise be to God for the reading of his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the person that you are, for the grace that you give. For this particular season and this particular word, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, O Lord, be acceptable to you, O God, you who are our rock, our redeemer, our fortress, our provision. Amen. Well, once again, glad that you're with us. Glad that you're here. And I uh, just want to ask a few questions, as I often do in the beginning of a particular time of interpretation of God's word. And that uh, the question I want to ask, I guess, right now is this. Have you ever noticed that the very place in the scriptures where God is the most blunt about prospering his people and providing them with a, a future and a hope, you know, Jeremiah 29, is the very place where uh, his people were outcasts from their own country and literally, literally slaves of the new regime that had taken over Jerusalem and exported all the people into slavery. And I mention that for one reason, and that is this. God doesn't tend to preen the feathers of the cocky. He tends to comfort those who need the comfort the most. He comforts those who need him the most. Sometimes at the time that they need him the most. And the sobering thing, I suppose, from a Canadian perspective these days is that from a perspective from the perspective of the parable of Luke in Luke 16, where Abraham comforts the poor man who was covered in sores, that other parable that Luke tells us about in terms of the contrast between riches and poverty. You know, it's, um, it is the truth that Abraham is the one who actually takes the poor man to his side. It's the rich man who is left a beggar. It's the rich man who ignored, after all, the same beggar at his gates when he had the opportunity to do something differently. And the situation is reversed in this particular situation. God comforts the afflicted. And that, that's a well-known expression that we need to understand. is very, very scriptural. Now, God is certainly able to prosper people. Indeed, God even prospered Abraham himself. But... Does he do such things for superfluous reasons? That's the question that also needs to be asked. It is interesting to ponder the reality that perhaps the, perhaps the greatest moment in Abram's life where he actually had an, a, an overabundance, a superabundance of prosperity, which came after the defeat of the kings of Shinar and Elam in Genesis 14, that was the very moment that also happened to coincide with Abram giving one-tenth of the spoils of war, you might say, to Melchizedek, priest of Salem, that mysterious character. And then he gave the rest back to those whom he had rescued while paying those who went from his own household on the rescue mission and into combat the rest. The truth is that even before the covenant, even before Abram became Abraham, Abram looked to God for the future. 
and for the hope. And not to mortals and not to the fortunes of war, certainly. For Abraham, as we would come to know him, it was sufficient to be a child of God. It was sufficient to have a future by faith. It was sufficient to have a covenant with the Almighty. Now you've no doubt heard these days and before, long before these days, the people who are talking about prosperity gospel. And you know, there's always an ounce of truth to a particular theological claim. That may be true, but you know, the truth is also, also, that more often than not in the Bible, there is a sufficiency gospel. A sufficiency gospel. God's grace is enough. His gifts are enough. We are certainly promised all things, yet in this life we don't need all things. We just need some things. I will not quote Paul lightly when he says this, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And I believe it. He says that in Romans 8.32. It is true that through Christ, as heirs of the coming kingdom, we are promised all things. But I think we also need to be prudent about this age as well. What would precisely all things do to us in our still sinful state other than build our own hubris? I tell you this frankly. If you and I right now had all things, we would scarcely love our neighbor, let alone worship God, because what's the point? We're all sufficient. In our sinful state, that would certainly warp us to receive all things. So it is that I have, a chin, I have a tendency to generally observe that the only people fit to receive much or all things in this life are those people so utterly humble already, so utterly humble of spirit, that receiving all things would not kill their body or their soul in the process. And those people are few, and I'm not one of them. In fact, most of us aren't. One of them. So I propose that we replace any and all attempts at prosperity gospel with sufficiency gospel, which I will argue in some sense is much more authentic to the balance of Scripture. You know, the truth is, I'm routinely struck by the word enough in my life, that God's grace is enough. We repeat things, you know, fairly regularly, phrases like, give us this day our daily bread. Around here, you know, that's given at least every Sunday in the Lord's Prayer. And we read the foundational account of it today. And how can one not notice the, the, the very strong theme of enough that pervades that passage from Exodus 16? But you know, even if we want to focus just indeed on the Lord's Prayer itself, as Jesus deliberately reiterates, you know, the concept of the manna in the wilderness. It's daily bread. And we are still encouraged to ask even today for our daily bread as a net result. And the manna in the wilderness truly was daily bread, as we read. The people had to collect it daily. If they attempted to store it up, the stuff stank. It became worm-ridden. The only exception to this was on the day before the Sabbath. Then they could store up two days' worth, and it would not do that. The only other notable exception, if you read the full chapter of the 16th uh, chapter of Exodus, is that a jar of manna was also kept as a perpetual testimony and reminder of God's graces in the tabernacle. It was intended to be before the Lord. Otherwise, like I say, it truly was daily bread, sufficient for the day's needs, sufficient for the individual's hunger, for the family's hunger. You could gather as much as your hunger allowed, but you just couldn't store it. You know, even so, you know, I take from that a few lessons, but not the least of which is this. You know, we don't have to have all our week's plans figured out either. 
but we might just discover the grace along the way to have the day's plans figured out at least by the end of the day. Such bread, I think, such imagery is meant to be enough and it's meant to remind us that it's enough. But you know, that's not the only metaphor within Scripture we can draw this from. You know, Christ's forgiveness is enough. It's perfect as far as it is. The Lord often, in fact, recommends sufficiency, as in, you know, things like sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And what is sufficient if it is not a synonym for enough? We shouldn't even worry about something more than it is due, more than enough. When Paul records what the Holy Spirit says to him, my grace is sufficient or enough for you, he is noting the same principle in a sense. Paul didn't like his own weaknesses, the places where his own strength was insufficient. But God, you know, wanted to cover those gaps, wanted to teach in the midst of those gaps with his grace. And so that's precisely the lesson that Paul would have learned that God's grace was sufficient for him even in his weaknesses, even in his insufficiencies. You know, sometimes it's not about proving how proficient we can be as humans, but rather how sufficient we can be through Christ who strengthens and saves. Even given our stresses and strains and limitations, which God knows all too well, and so Paul had to learn, like we have to learn, to be content in all circumstances, knowing, knowing whose he was, which is critical. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's not a boast in his own abilities, by the way. <laughs> it has to be measured. It's not also a, a call for opulence or something like that. It's actually a, a, de a declaration that God will see him through Varying circumstances, whether it's high or low, in plenty or in hunger, in abundance or in need. So, you know, when North Americans sometimes proclaim, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, please understand the context of that. It is not a plea for self-sufficiency. It is actually uh, an understanding that he can survive, that he can actually be who he's intended to be sufficiently given the moment doesn't matter whether the moment is as great abundance to it or great need to it. He's learned how to expect God's grace in the middle of the varying circumstances that he faces. That's a more legitimate look at these kinds of things. You know, why is it that the Lord focuses on enough if it isn't the point that he is enough? You know, Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 3, Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Maybe some of us won't get to be superstars. That's okay. That's kind of a turbo abundance, if you want to say it. But I like the fact that God has called us to be competent. It's enough. Our competence as ministers of Christ comes from Christ. What God has given is sufficient for the task of ministry. And I'm not just looking at that in the formal sense, but also in all the other informal senses. What we've been given is for our competence, and Christ's gift is sufficient. God apparently gives us enough to underscore his own sufficiency for supplying our own needs. And, you know, we need to be candid. That's often the, the bottom line, that God's grace is enough. Abundance imagery in the Bible, which is, is, is interesting because it tends to have a purpose. You know, when Joseph sought to store up the grains of Egypt, it was in knowing what was coming upon Egypt. The Lord had revealed it through God's people, of course. Seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine, 
So let me ask you, were the years of plenty intended to be squandered with gluttony and partying and celebration? No. They were intended to be soberly meted out and administered for the lean years that were ahead. In other words, real abundance can and does happen, but it may well be for the divine purpose that God intends. It might just be meant for salvation in an earthly sense, if you take a look at that passage from Genesis. It might be meant for someone else's good. And I would encourage everyone who's watching to be aware of these things. Sometimes abundances happen. There might be a good question to ask, Lord, what is intended for this abundance? If God prospers your work, it is important for the believer to ask, for what larger purpose, O God? As Paul writes, godliness is not a means of gain. He goes on to write these things instead from the sixth chapter of 2 Timothy. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Wealth is not an end unto itself. As uncomfortable as it might be for human beings to understand this, God asks his people to be content with enough to let go of our natural inclination to hoard wealth in order to control our life's outcome. He asks us to trust him for the next day's gifts. He asks us to believe in daily bread. You know, humans, let's be honest, humans always want more insulation, of course. Something to act as a bulwark against possible crisis or possible limitation because we often feel out of control. The world is difficult. The world comes at us with different things that happen, surprises and crises. But you know, God wants us to understand that he is the bulwark against the unknown, against the inevitability of crisis, against the possibility of uncertainty, almost the inevitability of uncertainty. And you know, the ancient Israel, Israelites were compelled to come to terms with their own limitations in the desert. You know, let's be honest and frank. Wandering around Sinai for 40 years is not possible for tens of thousands of people. It's a pretty hostile climate. There are limited resources, all incredibly difficult to sustain. There are things like water and, of course, food. And what we find from the record of Scripture is bizarre on some level, and yet kind of necessary. You know, it's necessary that their shoes and their clothing didn't wear out during this time, because there wasn't a lot of means to replace them. And yet we find that the details even point in that direction, too. Such wandering in the desert is so unlikely that it can only be accomplished by the work of God. And so then it's not really surprising, is it, that the testimony of the Bible conveys a testimony of daily graces, daily miracles, where the people must learn to rely on God. You know, we Canadians have a good land here. It's in no way a desert except in very small locations. But the lessons in some respects are oddly the same. We must learn. Nevertheless, even with higher rainfall amounts and more lush vegetation in parts, to rely on God. We aren't in control of our outcomes. We cannot predict the stresses and strains that are coming our way. As regards our own finances, we may never feel entirely at ease or comfortable. But the question becomes, have we shockingly made it thus far? Is that not amazing? Have we a testimony of grace in the middle of stresses and strains? 
Have we a testimony of your grace is enough, O God? I suspect we do. You know, my being here, your being here, it's no different. You know, when I get into my vestibular migraine season, such as now, I often wonder at this rate of weakness, at this rate of nausea, how am I going to preach on Sunday, O Lord? How am I going to be in front of the camera? And yet I am often amazed that when it comes right down to it, God knows that his people are looking for a message. They need a message. They need a word. And so what, what is it that I find on your behalf? I find that his grace is enough. Your grace, O oh God, is enough for me. I'm here recording right now, and by grace I'll be outside on the balcony out back here Sunday morning doing the parking lot drive-in worship thing, and it's all because of grace. So how often it is that I find that God's grace truly is enough for me and for you. You know, when I look over my own Family's finances, when you look over yours, how often do you find that God's grace is sufficient? Sometimes you may reach a point where you kind of go, ah, how are we going to do this? And you know what? Sometimes those are fairly routine moments. There may not be much. There may not even be an abundance. There may even need to be a credit line tapped from a time or two. But how often do I find that in the midst of all that, there is enough to meet the need. And you know, Israel was trained to understand this principle by 40 years in the desert. And on the very day that the land that they would inherit could produce itself for their needs, the manna from heaven stopped falling in the night. Exodus 16, 35, that the manna says that the manna stopped at the border of Canaan. Joshua 5, 12 puts it this way, quote, And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the promised land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. End quote. But just because they were to eat the crops already sown and to drink from wells and cisterns that were already hewn, it didn't mean that they weren't reliant upon grace any longer. It just meant that it was a different form of grace. You know, that the temptation, of course, is to believe that you somehow provided for yourself. Yea, you. The temptation is to believe that abundance is not, made, not meant for divine purposes. Well, when the land of a rich man produced abundantly in the parable Jesus taught the crowd in Luke 12, there was a clear record of the man asking himself, asking himself what to do. There is no record of him asking God what he should do with the unexpected increase. But do we hear of him making his own plans? Yes, we do. And what do those plans involve? Well, he wants his soul to relax. He wants to build bigger barns so he can store all the more. He wants to party. He wants to eat, drink, and be merry. He wants to feed himself. And even though the rich farmer never talked to God at this point, God certainly talked to him. Fool, God says. This night your soul is required of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? And so it is that Jesus warns his listeners to be rich toward God and not simply lay up treasure for themselves, to submit their abundance to God's oversight. And what's wrong with that? You know, God has promised the birds, he's promised the ravens enough. God has promised the lilies not only the necessities of their existence, but has granted them great beauty beyond the clothing of mere mortals. How much more will God provide the necessities of life for those who are made in his image? Clearly, 
Jesus is saying, he will, he does. Therefore, I think it is incumbent upon the believer, when abundance happens, to ask God about it. He has promised you enough. His grace is quite sufficient. But his abundance may be meant for other graces. Are you willing to overflow? Is the next question there. Nevertheless, if we park beside ourselves this notion about abundance just for a moment, we can certainly just count on this. His grace is enough. His grace is sufficient for us. His abundance will always have a purpose. I believe that to be true. But in the meantime, we can count upon his graces. We have footing underneath our feet. We have a God who loves us more than the birds and the plants. He's made us in his image. And he's meant and he's made lots of things to provide for our needs. That's in his character. Glory to God, therefore. Walk it out with him. Trust him for the necessities. And when abundance happens, ask him why. These things are, I think, really, really important when we ask those questions about his gracious supply. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for who you are, for the character you are, for the fact that you are preparing all things for us as heirs. But until that time, O oh Lord, your grace is sufficient for us. We thank you for both the levels of those things, for their wisdom. We pray, O oh Lord, that we might be humble enough to receive from you all that you would, would uh, give to us. We pray that in the meantime, we might be also content with the one who loves us, who supplies our need. And not just us, but the birds, flowers of the field, indeed all creatures, great and small. We thank you, God. We pray your mercy upon this day and upon our understanding of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name.